Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Carrie Michaels, who is the founder and CEO at William Murray Golf. How's it going today, Carrie? Hi, Anthony. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm super excited. I am excited because it's a cool topic. I'm excited because I love your background for those of you watching on YouTube. <laughs> and, and I'm ex excited because you've had such a cool experience about working with uh, very neat brands in a digital space and then how you've uh, transitioned or positioned, you know, this next company. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background, how we got to here, and then I'll ask you some questions. Yeah, wonderful. Um so my name is Carrie Michaels. I founded William Murray Golf back in 2016. Uh, I say I was an entrepreneur because I, I started it and incubated it under another business. Uh, but really prior to starting William Murray Golf, my career was pretty varied. Uh, I had kind of jumped around and done everything from marketing to finance. I was in strategy, uh, sales operations. So I had really touched a lot of different things throughout my career. And um, all along the way, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur at some point. I just didn't quite know what that looked like. Uh, so I think a lot of those roles really led me and gave me that experience to, to be able to, to start my own thing. That's awesome. And I imagine those roles and the companies that you work for, you know, you got to see a lot of things. You got to learn yeah. how it was done well. And I'm sure you took your own <laughs> lessons of what not to do. Exactly. That is the beauty of being able to, you know, work for other companies and get that experience because you learn what works and what doesn't work. And you kind of figure out how you would, you know, how you want to lead um, when you're given that opportunity. And so, yeah, in, invaluable to learn that on someone else's dime. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just for those of you, like, obviously you can find you on LinkedIn, but some of the brands, the Chive and Oakley, which are amazing brands and why I'm personally excited about it is when you, I believe in having done, you know, 200 odd podcast yeah. episodes, when you see people who know when it's done so well with a great story that transcends, it makes me really excited for what you're building. So tell me, Tell me why. Why did you uh, <laughs> choose this brand? Why did you choose golf? You know, what inspired you to go this track? Yeah. So I was working at the Chive. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Chive, it is a, a humor blog. And they had an amazing e-commerce business attached to it where they would sell t-shirts and they were doing really well. The t-shirt said, keep calm and Chive on. Uh, but they also had t-shirts with Bill Murray's face on them. And so they had an incredible booming business at the time when I started in 2015, selling these t-shirts with Bill's face on them. And I was in charge of operations and really helping the team bring products to market. But I saw this one t-shirt with Bill's face on it with our now William Murray Golf logo. And they did it for charity and they, they sold like 2000 units in 24 hours. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. Um, and I was just always so amazed at how fast these Bill Murray t-shirts were selling out. So, um, having come from Oakley, cause prior to the chive, I was at Oakley and I was in sport performance and I loved, loved being in sport performance. Um, and so I, I was exposed to golf when I was at Oakley and I, I started kind of thinking about, I was like, gosh, you know, I feel like this t-shirt with this photo of Bill throwing his golf club could be a brand. Like it could be something bigger than just what's on a t-shirt. And so I, you know, I was chatting with John Rezig and, and Leo Rezig from the Chive. And, you know, I was like, gosh, what if we could build this into something else? And they were very excited about it. They were like, right, you know, see what the opportunity is, go do some research um, and, and come back to us. And so the more I really looked at it, the more I was like, gosh, no one is doing anything fun in golf. I mean, they really just weren't. It was all the brands looked exactly the same. Um, and this is back in 2015, 2016. And so I called it the sea of blue stripe polos. Um, and it was like, there was this unwritten uniform for guys on the golf course. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's part of, part of the problem with golf, right? You know, people want to have a good time. And I think, um, the apparel options out there weren't really doing that for them. And so if you think about Bill Murray and what he brings to the golf course, you know, he is uh, obviously, you know, an icon and a legend and everyone knows him for Caddyshack, but 
he genuinely loves golf and he's an amazing golfer. And uh, when you would see what he would wear at the Pebble Beach Pro-Am every year, I was like, gosh, that is so awesome. You know, he doesn't care what the, un, you know, the written uniform is that you're supposed to wear. He's wearing whatever the heck he wants. Um, and so that was kind of the genesis of the idea as well. Maybe we can use Bill Murray as the face of this brand and kind of give people permission to have personality and to be who they want to be on the golf course and not just look like everybody else. Uh, so that was the genesis. Um, I, like I said, I incubated the concept under the chive with my co-founder, Brandon Barrett. And then um, after our first season, which was in the fall of 2016, we sold out of everything almost immediately. And we we're like, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess we're on to something. Um, and so then we split out from the chive and we became our own C Corp. And uh, that was that was the start of the business. Well, I will admit that at the beginning of your story it did not click to me the William Murray. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good, you know, good golf <laughs> name. And it just boom. Um yeah. But what I think is so cool about that is like, obviously, you know, riding the wave of, of what's going on in popular culture and just culture in general, yeah. like the building right. of brands around an individual. So cool uh, to see the evolution of golf over the past decade. And you now have like full swing on Netflix and you've got like yeah. the waste management that is yeah. like allowing people to <laughs> experience golf and not like from like the origins of St. Andrews. Uh, so that's cool yeah. to be part of that. Um, tell me about what's that ride been like for you as a CEO going from incubated idea under these yeah. great founders to going off on your own now, you know, seven, eight years in, how's mm -hmm. that journey been for you? Well, I mean, to be honest, it's been pretty bumpy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when you're starting a business, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just, you know, didn't really understand at the beginning of the journey, what it was going to take and what that road really looked like. Um, I think one thing that's been really fascinating to me along this journey is, you know, in the very early days, you know, I started as what I would call a true entrepreneur. And that is, you know, my co-founder and I are huddled down, doing all the things, wearing all the hats, and, you know, you're just kind of getting stuff done. Um, and then, you know, as the business is growing very slowly, you're like, okay, I should probably hire someone to help us do this. And we can't handle all of the day to day anymore. So you have to slowly start hiring a few people. And what I started to realize is there was this gradual process going from where I was the one kind of doing all the things and being an entrepreneur to all of a sudden leading a team. Hmm. And, and it was kind of gradual in the background, but I remember, you know, 2018, 2019, kind of looking up and being like, Ooh, this is different. <laughs> I'm actually leading a team now. And what that meant is I had to start letting go of things. Um, and I think as a, as an entrepreneur and as a leader, that was kind of scary for me, um, letting go and, uh, trusting other people to, to get the job done. Um, and then really, you know, my role became less of getting in the weeds and doing the things and really more of setting the vision and the tone for the business and how we wanted to move forward. That's awesome. And like the company's still relative, I mean, it's relatively small to everything, but about 20 odd people or so. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. About 20 people. Cool. I mean, LinkedIn is an amazing tool. Uh, <laughs> what, so you talked about your evolution as a CEO, that learning and trusting other people to do the work. What has been the coolest kind of benefit of that? You know, seeing your people grow, what did you have like an aha moment where you're, I don't know, on the golf course or sitting at 10 years, like, oh my gosh, like this team did this. And it was just a cool kind of evolution point within your business. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it is, it, it's every day, right. You know, I look up and I'm like, I can't believe we're here and I can't believe, you know, we have a team that is really helping us grow this business. Um, I always say, I get really excited, you know, being a product-based business, you know, I can walk out in the world. And when I see people at the airport or I see people out on the street wearing William Murray golf, um, it gives me goosebumps. Cause it's like, wow, you know, we, we did that. Um, and I think, you know, from a team perspective, you know, it's just, it's really amazing, I think, to see people grow into different roles too. I mean, we've had some people here that started um, in one position and then have just continuously said yes to other opportunities along the way. 
and seeing them grow and stretch in those ways, I am, you know, so excited by that because, um, that's what I really want to do is, you know, help, help my team grow in new ways. And I think that's how I got to a place where I could be CEO. Cause I was saying yes to a lot of different opportunities too. And even though I had never done something before, I didn't want that to hold me back. And so it's something I try to, to emphasize, I think with our team as well. Awesome. Um, so let me, I'll take you back to your product days a little bit because, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. what I find interesting over the past couple of years, as I mentioned, there's been that shift from like influencer led brands who then have to sell a product on the back of a face. In this right. case, you're doing that. I also assert that the product is really good. You know, <laughs> as we talk to leaders here, whether that's product leaders or CEOs or salespeople, and they have to think about what are the ingredients mm. to a good product? What are the ingredients to create something that people want? And then if you can add in without giving away your secret sauce, you know, what are you seeing in the marketplace that has uh, impacted or driven the decisions that you've made as a company to go beyond, hey, we're just selling shirts with Bill Murray's face on it to, yeah. you know, we're really building a brand that is substantial and values-based. Yeah, I think um, to kind of start one of the the biggest key ingredient for us from day one has been to produce products that have high quality um, because you really, you get one opportunity with that customer. And what I didn't want was for people just to buy William Murray Golf because of Bill and because of his name, because that's not necessarily going to get them to keep coming back, right? You want, that might be the introduction and that might be the reason and the the how, like how they find out about us, but you want to build a customer base that is truly loyal and loves your product. You can only do that if you really emphasize quality. And so we, we've spent a lot of time in product development. Um, we work very closely with our factories and, and when we have had challenges along the way, we're, we're there to, to fix those quality issues very, very quickly. Um, I think the second super critical. It seems so basic, but it is to listen to your customers and to really put them first. Um, I think when you're starting something from the ground up, I mean, I remember in the early days being like, oh, you know, we, we got another sale today. And, you know, you'd watch the one, each sale kind of come in and you realize every single sale, there's a person behind there and they are taking time from their day to come to your website, to go search and to put something in their basket and to check out. And that is not lost on me, you know, every day, even as we've grown. And so every customer is critical to our success and what they're going to then go away and say about their experience in shopping, what they're gonna say about their experience with customer service, what they're gonna say about your product is really important because that's the word of mouth that you want. You want those customers to have this amazing experience so that then they go and they tell their other friends and, you know, word starts to spread. Um, you know, I think so many of us spend a lot of our marketing dollars on, you know, paid advertising and whatnot. And while that's important, um, you cannot replace uh, the organic word of mouth. And that is, you know, it's a lot cheaper <laughs> in some ways, um, but it's invaluable. So, uh, those have been have been really critical for us. I think it's uh, as I hear you talk about all of that, I think of like community. Like there's some people yeah. who want to sell something quickly and they're just like, cool, like transactions. Yeah. And you think of like how the chive grew as, as an as a community of chivers and yes. that really had that like the yes. spirit of it. And so it sounds yeah. like for you it's as just, your methodology or thinking, you're like, hey, I really want to make sure that the community of people that are representing themselves in another sub-community of golf or however you want to turn that around, uh, it, it needs to be done with integrity and and living to the value, probably William Murray himself, I might bet. Yes, absolutely. And I think, like you said, you know, I am coming from a couple of companies that did this, an amazing job at building community. And so I had seen that firsthand. Um, and it is, it is really 
important. And I think what's so cool is that I, you know, we wanted people to be able to see each other from, you know, across the fairway and be like, oh, that's a William Murray. And then there's this instant connection and you don't really know it's going to happen when you're starting to build the company, but um, it's really exciting to see it. I think the other, one other thing that I think has been critical too, and it, it happened organically and naturally for us, but it's building a scarcity model. Hmm. And so we kind of, we started off because we could only afford to buy so many polos. And so you only have so much cash to, to invest in inventory. We would buy, you know, a couple hundred of our polo and we'd sell out very quickly. And so what that did um, was build demand for the brand. And people were like, gosh, I, I'm, I, you know, as soon as something goes on sale, as soon as they send out an email, we want to be the first to go because we know it's going to sell out quickly. Um, and that, that also, that word also starts to spread in that community as well. And people will say, oh my gosh, you were able to get that old fashioned polo. Like I, I tried, but they sold out before, you know, before I could get it. And so we've kind of built that into some of our strategy as we've grown so that some of our most popular polos, we, once we sell out, we might not bring it back ever, or we might not, you know, maybe it'll be 12 or 18 months before customers ever see it again. Interesting. Cool. I think that's really neat. I didn't know about, and it's so funny how certain things can happen uh, by accident, you know, like the yes. story of like the roast, it's like, well, why do you chop off the roast? Well, it didn't fit in the oven. It's not that <laughs> we didn't want to make a bigger roast, but yeah. now like it, it's a core piece of the business model that is, um, you know, yeah. led to your success. So I think that's awesome. Um, Carrie, as we finish up here, what is one piece of advice you'd want mm-hmm. to give to leaders that are in your position, uh, you know, growing a business for the first time and, uh, yeah, I'll give the floor is yours as we finish up. Yeah. So, you know, I think kind of going back to strategy, I think what I have seen is that, you know, when you're in large organizations, um, larger organizations are used to having, you know, one, three, five year, very formal strategic plans and presentations. And I think for us as a startup, what I, you know, some of my advice is it's okay to be a little bit messy in the beginning because, you know, you're still in those early stages of building out your processes and building some of these things out. But what you do need are guardrails. And by that, what I mean are clear priorities for yourself and for your team. And so I think one of the benefits of being a startup is you can't, you are nimble and you can pivot and you can say yes to things, but you got to be really clear as to what is going to set you on the right path for growth and success? And what are some things that are probably just distractions and you should ignore? Um, And so, you know, you might not have a formal, you know, strategy and roadmap, but I think the setting those clear boundaries and priorities up front, even in the early days is, is really important. Awesome. I couldn't have said it better myself. So I love that. And so if you're doing strategic planning, be sure to reach out to SME strategy. And if you are doing golf, or even if you're not doing golf, and you want to just look dang good, go visit William Murray. So uh, Carrie, where can people uh, get some apparel? Where can they get swagged out? And where can they learn more about you personally? Yeah, so you can go to our website, William Murray Golf, and you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Carrie Kaloran Michaels. Uh, and, um, I would love to chat with you all. That's awesome. Carrie, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been a pleasure and I wish you and your team nothing but success as you make the world even more fashionable in the world of golf. (laughs) Thank you, Anthony, for having me. Absolutely. So folks, my guest today, Carrie Michaels, who is the co-founder and CEO at William Murray Golf. One of the cool things about, you know, everything we chatted about today was just like getting sticking to your roots, recognizing that there's a lot of cool ways to do great things. And as a CEO and owner, your roles are going to evolve and change and, and allowing both your team the freedom to grow into that space. And for you to give yourself permission to give some of that up, I think it's critical. So uh, I inspire you to see wherever you're at in terms of your leadership, where you can make a great story happen and where you can give somebody space to grow. So I hope you enjoyed today episode of the strategy and leadership podcast. Thank you for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for being you. And I'll see you next time.